Right, uh, hi everyone, my name is Alison Watson um, and welcome to our final session of our Pharma Communication Series under the ASEAN Fall Army Worm Action Plan. Uh, my name is Alison Watson, I'm very pleased to be moderating this session. We have a wonderful range of experts, uh, like usual, that are joining us today. And I also have our fantastic project assistant, uh, Putra Andika, assisting with the workshop. And I'll just move my screen. And here is our lineup of our five excellent speakers. So the session is gonna be very fast paced again. We've deliberately chosen speakers that give very different perspectives based on real case studies in the field. Uh, and our case studies come from examples in Southeast Asia or South Asia. Now, before we start, I just want to run quickly through how you will interact on the Zoom platform today. Uh, it's very easy. The key message really is that we want your questions and we'll make plenty of time to um, ask those to our speakers, but please put them in the Q&A box. It really helps us to manage the session. But if you want to share your thoughts, any research links, publications, uh, make general comments, please make these in the chat box. Uh, and we really encourage that chat as well. Um, if you have patchy Wi-Fi or network problem, we can't really do much, but you can send us a message and we can maybe help um, through the chat uh, if you are having any problems, or you can try logging off uh, and on again, uh, sometimes works as well. Now, today's session is the last of a four-part series to catalyze action on the development and design of more effective pharma communications um, on IPM and fall army worm control. Uh, but we've actually drawn on a very broad, uh, broad presentations and, and projects to sort of bring different perspectives on how to connect with uh, and understand pharma decision-making. This is our last session. Uh, so we're at the very end. All the presentations and videos are at the ASEAN fall army worm action pharma communication page which is up there on the screen and I can send it to you again uh, at the conclusion of this workshop. We really uh, encourage you to send case studies that you know of or are involved in and if you could do that you can send it to faw at growasia.org. Um, once again, we really encourage uh, an interactive sort of discussion. You can also give us your feedback and questions in the Pharma Communication Forum uh, at the ASEAN FAW Action Forum Pharma Communication, and the link is there. And lastly, if you want a certificate of participation, which I know some of you do, you must subscribe to the Pharma Communication Forum and either ask a question or share something interesting about pharma communication. And you can do that by going to community, uh, and then going to the forum and then going to the pharma communication link uh, at that forum. Okay, I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Brian Cook. Brian is from the School of Geography, Earth and Atmospheric Science at the University of Melbourne and has been working in Cambodia investigating the power of social relations in the context of what factors drive behavioral changes amongst Cambodian cassava farmers. Brian, welcome. Thank you very much, Alison. I'll switch to sharing my screen now. Yep, I'll just stop my share. Oh. Perfect. Let's see if this works. Could someone give me a wave if they can see my screen? That's, that's perfect, Brian. All right, fantastic. I'll get going. And here we go. Uh, hi there. Uh, my name is Dr. Brian Cook. I'm based at the University of Melbourne. I'm a human geographer who studies risk and human behavior using participatory and action-oriented engagements. I'm just going to hit a timer because I'm also a stickler for time, um, and I'll make sure I keep to it. Today I'm going to present on research that engages with cassava farmers in northwest Cambodia. Uh, the work explores their decision making and their uptake or not of agricultural technologies and pro practices. The paper for this talk is now drafted, so thank you for the nudge on that. And uh, I'm happy to share that if people are curious or want to um, have a read. Uh, you just have to promise to provide some feedback and not share it any further. I'll keep to time. Um, I really enjoy questions, and uh, so we'll, we'll hopefully uh, get that through. I, I should also note that I was a little slow in getting Alice in my slides, and I just want to take a moment to thank her for her efforts in organizing these kinds of workshops. There's a lot of work involved, and I know that we're all grateful. I'll also note that I'm running an inception meeting uh, in an hour, and so please forgive me for not sticking around to the very end. I, I thoroughly enjoy the questions and back and forth, but um, I have to leave uh, to, to jump through the hoops of donors uh, in, a, in a short time. So let's jump into this right away. There we go. 
Uh, today I'm going to begin with a brief description of the research so that you can understand the basis of the, the argument I'm going to offer. Uh, I've relied heavily on excerpts from the interviews with farmers and their households, um, and each of these are representative views that are drawn from many of the engagements that we've taken over the last five years. I'm not going to go through each of the citations in, at, during the talk, there's just not enough time, so please kind of skim those as we go. In brief, so that you know where this talk is heading, I, the argument that I'm going to make is that agrarian change is a product of an assemblage of experiential learning and social relations. And what I mean by that is that farmers are, have extremely limited capacity and opportunities to affect change in their lives. Now, no doubt they are adaptive, creative, rational, and highly adept agri at agricultural transitions, but they are also subject to innumerable and often exploitative relations, which structure their options and their actions. So for this audience uh, and your focus on effective farmer communications, my talk, I think, will act as a counterweight or a reminder that communications aimed at farmers must account for their situations. What our research shows is that awareness isn't a problem for these farmers. They are well aware of options and alternatives and that change is much more a product of opportunity and support. And so as an aside, the project, the follow-up project that I'm uh, running the inception meeting for later on um, is uh, actively supporting farmers in accordance with their expressed desires and then measuring the impact of that uh, kind of support based form of agricultural extension. So um, stay tuned, I suppose. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the, the data that the project uh, collected as part of its effort. It, there's a ton of data. Um, we're going to focus on data arising out of the 300 household interviews. Um, I do think it's important that we talk about the theory of change, and I don't want to belabor this next point, though if you're interested, I've written a review paper on the deficit model and communications in the context of climate change, which is open access and linked at the bottom of the slide, um, as well as a review of agricultural extension, uh, also open access and linked. Um, in general, I don't believe that communications prompt lasting behavior change in people who wouldn't already be well on their way to making those behaviors. Uh, I appreciate that the communications discourse is where some of the most compelling critiques of one way communications or deficit based framings can be found. So please don't feel that I'm painting with too broad a brush. But I think it's important that we ask ourselves what we expect of communications. If the assumption is that an external party can inform, educate, manipulate, nudge, or otherwise attempt to influence farmer behaviors, I don't think this is an effective theory of change for a lasting intervention. For me, communications are part of a wide assemblage of activities contributing to behavior over time, uh, though it's a, a small and relatively weak lever uh, with which to affect farmers' behaviors on its own. Um, and I hope that doesn't affect, uh, upset anyone. I, I suspect people who are involved in comms uh, know this very well, um, but it's, I think, important that we, we um, set the bar appropriately for communications. We conducted a, a baseline to find out who we were dealing with. And so the baseline survey describes the cassava farming households who were sampled for the research, offering uh, some insights into the general character of the households, about 400 of them participated. These are predominantly households of four to six individuals with a male head who's married and who has completed primary school level education. There are a uh, mass variety of circumstances, and, and this is especially pronounced in, with regard to the amount of accessible farmland and the nature of land titles in Cambodia is quite a sensitive topic. Most importantly, from the uh, quantitative survey, with regard to the issue of agricultural extension, the households identified specific agrarian changes that they believe would benefit them. And, transitioning to fruit tree production was the, the most popular one. Um, the, though transitions are bounded by an individualized framing in which responsibility rests almost entirely with the household and the extended family. So the isolation and portrayal of agrarian change as an individualized activity is both supported by the quantitative data as well as the qualitative interviews, um, which also hint at the informal social relations that contribute to on-farm practice change. I'm now going to move to the qualitative findings in order to better understand or explain uh, the rationalizations that farmers uh, tell us about and exhibit as part of their decision making in the context of agrarian change and agricultural extension. So why did farmers transition to cassava? Well, the overwhelming majority of cassava farmers describe the process of transitioning to cassava production as the outcome of multiple social relations, many occurring simultaneously through different social networks. In general, the farmers become aware of a possible alternative crop, in this case cassava, through their social networks, which act as a mechanism of awareness raising. 
for our sampled farmers, this was overwhelmingly their neighbors. More than 95% of them identify a neighbor as their primary source of information. Um, in many instances, this neighborly relation also had ties with Thailand or Vietnam or with traders who visit rural parts of Cambodia to purchase directly from farmers. When asked um, what made you start planting cassava, most of the farmers described a successful neighbor who had already implemented the transition who those particular respondents would emulate. And you see in the quotes there that they follow one another. They are uh, very apt and keen to um, replicate what their neighbors are doing. So how do farmers verify the information or the practices that they receive through various channels? Well, um, perhaps the most important finding of the research is recognition that agricultural extension is not a top-down activity involving experts, the state, or donors. Instead, agricultural extension is an assemblage of local social practices that are almost entirely informal and, for the most part, not for profit. And this is unlike the characterizations of agricultural extension within it within the vast majority of the discourse, as well as amongst the sustainable development goals or the IPCC reports that link farmer decision making with climate change adaptations. Uh, family and already trusted relations are how farmers assess the effectiveness of the information or awareness of a new practice. Um, throughout the 300 engagements, these relations created an ability for farmers to vicariously experience alternate practices, which is their way of informing themselves about future decision makings. And I think that that's really an essential um, recognition. So we know why they transition. We know where they get their information. Um, where do farmers get official uh, information or expert advice? Uh, the final question from the quantitative survey asked who has the power to support their efforts to implement change? A large uh, number of the respondents answered with variations on family. We created categories to be as fine as possible, but 80 one percent of respondents included one of one or more of the answer myself the head of household family children grandchildren husband or wife or parents with only 14 percent of respondents even mentioning uh, an organization or an individual outside of that kind of familial unit and so what we see is that um, they don't get uh, expert advice and we ask them explicitly through follow-ups are you sure you didn't talk to the agricultural department did no one come by and offer advice did nothing um, and, and so what we see is, is it goes back to these neighbors. And uh, I just want to stress how important they are. So these farmers are disconnected from what we understand or what the discourse tends to portray agricultural change or extension services as, um, which means that, the, that many of the official and expert efforts to support them are disconnected from how they inform themselves, which I think is a, um, a real challenge for those of us involved in agrarian change and research that aims to support these farmers. Throughout the talks, though, there was this one kind of um, actor who, who was in almost every interview, and that was the pesticide vendor. So across the 300 interviews, there's a contradiction between feelings of isolation and this universal presence of the pesticide vendor. As mentioned uh, in the preceding experts, the pesticide vendor is a constant non-familial social relation, and in most cases, the only expert that these farmers have any contact with. And this finding is relatively unsurprising given the, the for-profit change uh, to the business model around agricultural extension. Um, but the, the farmers were very dubious about um, the pesticide vendors' vestedness. They are well aware of the profit motivation of official extension activity, activities and, and, and individuals. And therefore, again, they revert to their neighbors and to trusted social relations to make sense of advice or change or witnessing of other practices or hearing it of a new crop or a new um, behavior that they could implement through their, their existing social relations. So in conclusion, whew, almost right on for 10 minutes here, um, what, have we, what have we shown in our research? Well, farmers are alone or they feel alone and are subject to extreme precarity and exploitation. Any action that they take is debt fueled. And I, I didn't go into the microfinance industry in Cambodia, but it's an incredibly problematic uh, lending relation. Um, so making change is an extremely costly and complex decision for them. They don't lack information, um, but they lack trustworthy support. The guiding question of this talk was how powerful are social relations? And I hope some of those excerpts, if you were able to skim through them, or if you just take my word for it, um, is to see that they are incredibly important. And, and for many of these farmers, they are their sole source of, of reliable or trustworthy information. Um, one of the questions guiding this talk was what 
factors drive behavioral changes amongst Cambodia cassava farmers. And it's their neighbors, uh, it's their family members who are also often neighbors and their trusted social relations who are neighbors and family members. And so um, coming around to uh, communications and effective engagement with farmers, I hope that um, those sort of findings and, and you know, they are, there's a, a great deal of data behind, behind them to support that. Beg the question about then what, what is the role for communications in that sort of situation? And um, I hope that this group and, and its activities can, can then take that kind of question on. So there's lots of ways of getting in touch with the project and getting in touch with me and um, you know, all our funders and uh, people who have contributed, uh, including all of my colleagues. And um, I think I'm pretty close to time there. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, excellent presentation, and you've raised lots of lots of questions, and, and even some you provoked a few probably questions as well in people's minds. Um, I it, lots of um, I have some questions, and also if the audience has questions, please put them in the Q and A box. I'm quite interested because you said that uh, that people seem to get their information from the successful neighbour. That was one of those key points. So where do they get their information from? Yeah, it's, it's, it's like that, um, where does it begin? Or how, how long is yeah. a piece of string? Yeah, um, we get the same story. They're, 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 it's a network. And I think that's the best way of describing this sort of uh, intervention. There were instances of particularly influential uh, wealthy farmers or the village leader acting as a kind of uh, someone who would try things earlier, an like early adopter, if you want, um, and they would emulate that process. There was also uh, examples of some outreach from traders, from, um, there's, there's all sorts of people trying to support them, but it always came back to them describing, observing neighbors and engaging with neighbors, speaking with their neighbors. And so, you know, adoption is not this one moment in time where they're actually put up a, a new crop in the ground. It's a, it's a very extended process that's occurred over sometimes years. Um, and there are many relations that lead up to that. And throughout all of those interactions, it's constantly back to the neighbor to have those discussions. And so um, it, I would never say it's only neighbors, but I think neighbors are the determinants. They are the way that people sound out their thinking, they hear advice, they're engaging with people who are living in the same system and working in the same agricultural system. So the, the, the advice that they get from neighbors is someone who probably also has to have these high debt rates and is worried about climate change and is worried about traders. And so they, they feel empathy from their neighbors. And so it's a constant effort to consult with them. Okay. And so what does that mean, do you think, for how we design projects to reach out to farmers? I mean, who, who are, how do we design a project that takes into account the social networks and, and these, the importance of who's next to you and who's farming next to you? Yeah, um, I, I struggle with a role for communications. Um, it, and it depends how you define it. Communications houses such a broad you know, from deficit to dialogue. No, but I mean, not just communications. We're talking about uh, communications as a two-way thing, but understanding how to enter into these social networks and, and provide support. You, you say yeah. that farmers are isolated. So how do we make them less isolated? Yeah, well, we engage with them. I mean, one of the... the, the but is the that not communication? Um, Engaging? It depends how it's done, I suppose. And so, okay. for example, in this project, we spend a lot of time with them. We spend, we have teams in villages listening with no agenda. We don't come thinking mechanization or transition. To so whatever. would that be a good form of communication then sitting down, taking a lot of time with these farmers, listening to their perceptions? I mean, and understanding that before you, before you design interventions. Do, were your results of this study, I mean, they similar to the results that you've seen in other studies? I know, I know this has been looked at in other, this, the importance of social networks and farmer groups. Have you seen that the same or similar findings? We see some similarities, the importance of those social networks. Um, does it stand out exactly? Um, hmm. The Northwest of Cambodia is very difficult because it's undergoing such rapid boom and bust transitions. Yep. So I think sure. what we see there is a very amplified version of what is, is hinted at in other locations. Um, yep. Yeah, I, I, I don't think, hmm, it's hard to say. There's, there's a yeah, yeah, zillion no, research bits out there, so I wouldn't want to claim okay. 
claim too strongly that originality because I'm sure one of the audience is probably saying this as well. <laughs> no, that's okay. No, um, no, I was just wondering if, if there was anything surprising in, in, Cam in this Cambodia uh, particular study because I think all of this is very context dependent and we'll yes. see that through the other speakers today that you really have to understand your context which I think is a really good reason for really communicating well sort of two way understanding what's happening. But yeah, listen, it, I've got a couple of questions here. Excellent presentation, Brian, that this um, uh, question. Since you said that farmers are trusting their village leaders from whom the technologies yeah. are passing on, would it be worth identifying those village leaders who could be the sources from which those technologies could be passed on? Okay, I'm going to jump in there. Uh, they, don't, yep. they don't necessarily trust their village leaders. They emulate, they watch, yep. they study. But these are... Um, highly imbalanced power relations in these villages. And so, and the village leader is often um, as, as dangerous and risky as, as, as anyone. I mean, let's appreciate this is post Khmer Rouge. This is a place where there are lingering warlords um, who mm -hmm. were affiliated with those groups who are now in control of villages. So um, it's, it's fraught, those relations are fraught. Okay. And people are so precarious and, and impoverished in many senses. and they are holding on very tightly to the kind of last runs of the ladder with the next stop being landlessness or debt bondage into brick kilns, all sorts of awful processes. And so okay. these farmers have to be extremely cautious about who they trust and, and who they okay. engage with. So, so, so would I, that I wouldn't be a little bit, the leader. <laughs> so would that be a little bit like, the, the second question here is what's the main reason they don't listen to experts? Is it because there's a disconnect or is there a lack of trust? You, you may have sort of answered that in your yeah, last but, answer. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't separate the two so much. I mean, uh, one of the things that we do is our in-country partners are, uh, we formed an NGO with them to support them, but they had already been active in these communities for more than a decade. They knew yep. people, they had relationships with them and they had formed a trusted relationship with them and then worked with us. And so um, this isn't about, you know, uh, me as a white male, you know, kind of coming from Australia to kind of come into these villages. It's more me working with, uh, existing organizations in yep. the area and supporting them and, and working with them who are okay, then great point. engaging with farmers. And so okay. I think it's really important that they that we recognize the need for culturally sensitive people with experience with long-term relationships with these individuals uh, founded on okay. familiarity and trust. Okay. Uh, one last question here. Are the communications predominantly face-to-face -face or were they are there conversations through social media, Facebook groups, WhatsApp? How are farmers communicating? Yeah, um, well, pre-COVID, uh, everything was face-to-face. -face. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you'll hear that a million times, right? Uh, and so we have had to switch into some different forms. They're not what we were seeking um, and they're not um, something that we think is ideal. We would prefer it to be face-to-face -face, and we're very much looking forward to returning to the field early next year. Um, but that's not to say they aren't useful. And I, I, I would hate to come across as someone who's anti-comms or something like that. Communications are really uh, a key part of any broad holistic approach to supporting farmers. Um, it's what we expect of it, uh, which I think I, I said in the talk. It's yep. we, we can't rely on the comms to do the hard work of building the relationship. The building of yep. the relationship is that coffee or beer uh, out in a village, hearing about people's lives and, and really listening and yep. developing support that starts there with with what they've told us and what they've asked for um and and rather than the opposite no oh, no that's no that's great brian and i think that's what we've been talking about as part of the series that it's not just comms as in sending a, a poster or sending yeah. something to tell people what to do it's actually about communicating with a two-way conversation really listening to both parties and understanding and, and in some cases many parties as we'll see from Rika's uh, presentation at the end uh, thank you so much Brian for joining us good luck with your inception meeting today so I know much. you're carrying on with this project so all the luck with that and we'll, we'll look forward to hearing um, how that goes uh, and feedback on it so thank you very much oh thanks I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all you know it's great thank you Okay, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Laura Kwong. Now, Laura assured me that this is not directly related to uh, what we're talking about today, but we did really want to bring somebody back to talk about the success of this project. Uh, and um, it was raised in, I think, our second session in, in July. Uh, and it was very interesting. And it was around the design and, and implementation of a very successful project to encourage people to wear masks, uh, starting off in Bangladesh, called the, the Norm 
norm project or, or normalizing mask wearing project. So, so don't be too tough on Laura around extrapolating uh, exactly to our pharma communication on integrated pest management. But we did think it was a really useful um, project to show you um, how this was designed and how it resulted in quite a successful um, outcome. So Laura, welcome. Uh, and, and I'll just say Laura's an assistant professor from the School of Public Health and University of California. So it's quite late over there. So thank you for joining us. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for the introduction. So yes, this is uh, a study conducted in rural Bangladesh. And so the, many of the people who were involved were farmers, um, but it is not about anything related to farming. Um, the intervention is different than probably a lot of farming interventions in that it is visible. It is a mask that is on your face. Right, so different than what seeds are you putting in the ground or what you know, machinery equipment are you using? What strategies are you using for storage? This is right up there in your face. And so it's very obvious to your neighbors what you're doing and what you think, right? Um, Brian was just saying how people get information from their neighbors that actually requires communication. Here, you just look at someone and you're like, well, they're wearing a mask. So I guess they think it's a good idea, right? So um, I think I'll, I'll save more time for questions um, and, and we'll have more time for links there. So very interdisciplinary study, again, conducted in rural Bangladesh. The main motivations were, you know, we don't have vaccines yet. What can we do in the meantime to reduce the burden of COVID in um, particularly in South Asia, but in all places that have slower vaccine rollout? So what we did was a very large clusterized, cluster randomized trial. We had 600 villages, a total of almost 350,000 adults. Um, in 300 villages, we promoted masks. Some of those we promoted surgical masks and some of them were promoted cloth masks. And we tried a variety of strategies to get people to wear masks. Again, these are strategies that you might consider if you were trying to convince farmers to plant a certain type of seed or you know, try to new technologies, but they might be slightly different because again, we're looking at a very visible intervention. Um, we also evaluate the effect of these masks on COVID transmission. So why did we work in Bangladesh? As many of you know, it's very densely populated. We had low mask wearing and we had really strong local capacity. We all know the importance of your implementing partner um, and, and their relationship with community members. So what we did was we had um, this model we call NORM, which stands for no cost mask distribution. This was done door to door. So when you're thinking about your interventions, are they group based or are they sort of door to door talking to the farmer? We offered information and in our case, we made um, videos and we had brochures. Um, very importantly, we did reinforcement. And so sometimes, you know, your intervention might go back to the farmer every month, might go every week. We had someone roving around in the community um, most days, <laughs> starting at the start, it was really intense promotion. Someone was there six out of seven days saying, um, excuse me, I, I see you're not wearing a mask. Uh, would you like to put on a mask? Would you like another mask, right? I really care about your health and I want you to wear a mask. And so we think that in-person promotion was really, really important, right? Really driving home your message that we think this intervention is important, not giving it once and then like, okay, we'll follow up in a month, um, which I understand is a constraint because we just have limited resources, um, but we really wanted to make a habit. And so we thought when well, we really um, do a lot of reinforcement of this habit at the very start, right after we introduce the intervention. Finally, we use modeling by uh, trusted leaders. And so again, this relates back to Brian, who are those trusted leaders? Well, in this case, you know, we were looking at um, political leaders, religious leaders, imams. Um, apparently that's not who most people are getting information from in the Cambodian context, it's mostly their neighbors, but how might we think of leveraging these people more? Um, because they were effective in, in this study. So we um, directly measured, are people wearing their mask or not? Are they putting it over their chin, right? Not so helpful, or they're not wearing anything at all. We also measured whether or not there was physical distancing, right? That's another um, concern that WHO and CDC had where at the start was, okay, maybe they'll wear a mask, but then maybe they'll kind of get close to each other because they think that they're very protected. Um, we measured COVID. So we asked about who had symptoms of COVID and if you reported to have symptoms, we collected some blood and we tested that for the COVID antibodies. Um, a lot of detail, just to say that in this study, we tested uh, the behavior change communication techniques, not through the formative research that I usually do and that I'm sure many people on this call usually do, right? We do 
very small scale pilots and we'll do formative research with focus groups or in-depth discussions to better understand what's gonna motivate people, right? Um, and what we did here was kind of try everything, which you can do when you have 600 villages, right? Because in every village, you can try a few different combinations of behavioral um, strategies, and then you can see which ones produce the outcome that you want, which in this case was mask wearing. But most people don't have the luxury of working with 600 villages at a time to assess which type of behavioral strategy is gonna work best. Um, but that's what we did in this study, so I'll just tell you how it works. So we had different village level randomizations, which means you know, one village, we had 100 that got cloth masks and we had 200 villages that got surgical masks. Um, in some villages, everybody got a text message reminder that said, keep your mask by the door so it's ready to take out when you leave. Or wearing your mask is a way to protect the young people and the um, older people in your family, right? Some village leaders got uh, monetary incentives of about $190. Some um, didn't get an incentive. Some got a good governance incentive. Right, so all of these were at the village level. We also had a range of household level uh, incentives. Some, um, this means that different households in the same village could have different incentives or, or different um, behavior change uh, strategies. So we asked some households to put a sticker on their door that said, we're a mask wearing household, right? Leveraging that commitment feeling. Um, we asked other people to make a verbal commitment to say, you know, we promise that our household is going to wear masks. Um, we also vary the language we give, really thinking about the psychological framing of um, the messages. So for some people it was wear a mask so you can protect yourself. And for some people it was wear a mask so you can protect you know, your grandparents who live in your house with you, right? And so again, we use a whole variety of behavioral strategies here, everything from economic incentives to sort of psychological framing. Um, the randomization was very, difficult. Um, and again, because we had 600 villages, we could assign each village to a different combination of behavioral strategies. And then we could see who, uh, which villages were wearing the most masks and which um, behavioral strategies did they have, right? So the short story is, after we conducted the whole um, trial in 2021, um, we did some statistics on with the outcome being who is wearing masks and the inputs being, you know, which kind of behavioral mechanisms that they have. And what we found was masks work to prevent COVID, that's great. We were able to increase mask wearing by about 30 percentage points. That means in the control village, we had about 13.4% of people wearing the masks and in the other treatment villages, it was 43%, right? So that's pretty good if you think about your interventions and really getting a large chunk of the population to start doing the thing that you asked for. 30 percentage points is pretty good. And what we see is that 30 percentage points resulted in a reduction of COVID by about 12% um, in terms of symptoms and about 10% in symptomatic um, COVID. So um, never mind the actual values here. The point is that we wanted people to wear masks to reduce COVID. We got people to wear masks using a, a variety of strategies and it did indeed reduce COVID. Um, and for the people who are really interested in like COVID itself rather than farmer education here. Um, it's important to know that, right, this is a rural area. Most people's lives are outside, right? They're farmers, they're working in the fields. And so we asked them to put on masks when they were around other people in public. And that is what resulted in this reduction of COVID, right? So it's not just the busy cities or indoor shopping malls where you need to wear a mask, but really it helped even in this rural setting to wear a mask. So the most important parts, um, mask wearing increased in all of these different locations that we tested it. Um, it persisted over time, which is definitely what we want to see with our interventions, right? We don't want the intervention to stop right when we leave. Um, it was only eight weeks, and then we checked again um, at week 10. We also checked about two months later, and we still saw that the intervention and people were wearing masks about 10 percentage points more in the treatment villages than the control villages. So again, we know that when we leave, our intervention is going to drop off, but we hope that there's a seed planted, right? That people have form, formed some habits or that the supply chain has been strengthened, that we can really um, make that intervention more sustainable. So we're glad here that we did see some sustaining. And we're actually going back to these communities to sort of like boost them up. So what we learned, most importantly, is, you know, what's, what's not needed for mask promotion in these settings. 
right? I'm not saying that when you're doing your farmer promotion, you definitely shouldn't consider any of these and they won't be useful. I'm just saying that in this particular setting where we're looking for an intervention about masks that cover your mouth, these things didn't seem to be effective. They still might be ideas for things for you to try if you've never tried them before, um, but do some more formative work to see if it would work for your type of intervention. So we looked at having legal sanctions, right? Because we know that in some places masks were required, but when we had the police accompany our promoter, uh, it didn't, didn't increase mask wearing. Um, signaling to others, in our case, you know, putting that sign on the door didn't necessarily help. A verbal commitment didn't necessarily help. Um, or, or didn't help, I should say, we found no significant difference. Text messages in our context did not increase mask wearing. Monetary incentives didn't increase mask wearing and we think it's because the threshold was too high, right? People, the village leaders just thought, oh, we can never get that many people to wear masks. And so um, they, they didn't appear to have helped. Um, and there was also a non-monetary incentive like a good governance award. Again, I'm not saying that these won't work for your farmer interventions. These are just things that we tried and they didn't work in our setting for this particular intervention. Um, I think I'll stop there and just, just ask if you have any questions. I think maybe a primary right. takeaway is just thinking about the different types of interventions that you can use and maybe trying something like a psychological framing intervention that you haven't tried before. Great, thanks, Laura. And thanks for, it's a good good end to this slide as well, because it, it just it shows the sort of different interventions that you looked at. Um, quite a few questions. Um, reinforcement, how important do you think that is around making it a habit? <laughs> we think that was extremely important. So we did a small scale pilot with just 10 villages. Uh, and the first one, we didn't have any reinforcement. We delivered the masks to households. Um, we asked leaders to promote them, but we saw mask wearing increase by about 10% points. In the second pilot we did with, with about 10 villages, we had these reinforcement people and we saw the increase by about 30 percent points. Um, and so, yeah, what would reinforcement look like for your particular intervention? Maybe it means that, you know, after you do the training, you follow up with the farmers every day for the next week, right? Or, you mm -hmm. know, every week for the next month, um, rather than saying, okay, we'll check in with you in six months, or we'll check in with you in 12 months, really trying to give them yeah. the maximum amount of support you can afford to do um, right at the start. And does it matter who those reinforcers are? Like, do the, is it best if they're local people? Or when we talked about the importance of social networks before, is it useful yeah. if they're within the same social network? Great question. So uh, we didn't test that because this was COVID. And so we used all local staff to avoid COVID transmission from village to village. We didn't want our promoters going to different villages, right? So I, I should say they were in the same sort of county um, mm -hmm. although not necessarily from that particular village. We do think that this intervention was more successful in a rural area than in an urban area, because in a rural area, you know, you know who's not wearing a mask. You recognize that person and you're like, oh, uh, uh, they're not wearing their mask, right? Or you see them get stopped by a promoter and then you can go gossip at the tea stall. Oh my gosh, did you see him? He got stopped by the promoter because he wasn't wearing his mask. Whereas in this <laughs> urban area, right? People don't really know each other. You don't really have yep. that same social awkwardness because somebody stopped you on the street, right? Yep. People no, stop you point. on the street all the time in urban areas. They want us to give you flyers and all sorts of things. So we think yep. that, you know, the, the sort of community setting and what Brian was saying that, that people know each other was really important. Okay. Now the question here around offering information, how did you decide, did, did you look at how you offered the information? I mean, what information you offered? Was that, were there different ways or different designs or did, yeah. did that, was that out beyond your uh, study? That's a great question. We, um, other than the psychological framing of that information, whether we use altruistic language or self-protection language, we didn't um, vary it too much because essentially in this study, we wanted to do everything we thought was gonna work. And then we wanted to test things that we weren't quite sure. But we were pretty sure that showing a movie with the prime minister, the national, uh, the head imam, and mm -hmm. a national cricket star was going to be effective in getting people to pay attention, right? All of those people were saying, here's why I wear a mask, right? Here's why it's important to wear a mask. And so we thought it's pretty likely people are gonna respond positively. So we don't wanna test some places where we don't use it, yep. right? But that's one way that we tried to engage the role modeling Right. So not only you have local community leaders that can support you, but you always just you also can show a video of 
a nationally recognized person endorsing your whatever it is intervention. Yeah, and and how those trusted leaders? I mean, you you said you sort of had that Emma uh, was an important trusted leader, but did you think about how you chose those trusted leaders? Yeah, I will and say that you... was an important thing. We realized that in some villages that were better performing, we had done a better job finding the trusted leader and actually engaging them more thoroughly. And in villages that were poor performing, we went back and we said maybe we didn't find the right leader you know, or maybe we didn't really get them on board. And so both finding the right person and really getting them to commit. And I think we made a mistake by not um, having specific actions for them to commit to. We just said, hey, leader, will you support us? They said, okay. And maybe they would accompany us one day in the field, but um, we're actually going to do this all over again. And our team came up with a list of sort of 20 actions that a community leader can do. Right, make it really easy for them to participate and help you. They can say, okay, of this list of 20, I can do these two. I can do these three, right? And then they commit to that. Then you can follow up with them and say, hey, did you do this thing that you said you were going to do? Yeah, no, that's excellent. Just before we go, one last question. What, what was the most surprising thing that you found in this project? Uh... I'm going, to I'm going to I'm <laughs> going to defer that question and say something that I sort of thought of afterwards was that yeah. when we went to households, right, to deliver that information to show the video, who do you yeah. think we were talking to? We were probably talking to women. Mm -hmm. When we were out in the rural areas and um, recording who was wearing masks, 88% of our sample was men. Right? Mm. So again, remembering to get to the people who you actually want to talk to and influence. Yeah. Right? And I think we kind of know this, it's like an obvious thing, but just sometimes the way you actually design the program and implement it, you like might have actually missed the influential decision maker, right? Yeah, so just great, to keep in mind. great answer. And and despite your, your project being very different, I think actually all those answers there were actually very applicable to our work. So thank you so much, um, Laura, for joining us. A really interesting awesome. project. Uh, I always think there's lessons to be learned from projects that are outside the sector that you're dealing with, particularly when you're looking at how do you design behavioral um, yeah. sort of projects to change behavior. So so thank you so much for joining us. It was a real pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually a really good uh, introduction to our next speaker, Roshana Devkota, because she's going to be talking about her work in Nepal where she was designing pictorial education resources uh, and reaching out to women and, and how important it was to design those with the user in mind. So thank you so much, Laura. And Roshana, that's your introduction. And, and thank you for already loading your presentation. Uh, please stay Start. Welcome. Thank you, Alison. Hi, everyone. I'm Rajana Devkota and basically from Nepal and currently reside in Canada, working as research fellow at University of Ottawa. Today, I'm going to present about a case study from Nepal on how to design effective farmers' pictorial education resources. And I, today, I have like, uh, I'm going to share the introduction about the research and its methodology, and I'll discuss about result and discussion and finally conclude with the conclusion. And this is the case study from Nepal on evaluating an effectiveness of picture-based agricultural extension lesson, which was developed using participatory testing and editing methods among the smallholder women farmers in Nepal. And this, this research was part of the IDRC funded project, you know, which was a Canadian organization. And the project name was Nepal Terrace Farmers and Sustainable Agriculture Gears. In short, we used to call SAP. And one of the main objective of the project was to reduce the workload of women by testing and disseminating small scale technologies and its associated information. For that purpose, Sustainable Agriculture Kids concept was um, launched, which was uh, like a collection of the low cost menu of tools, materials, seed and practice. And these practices were explained by using the picture based lesson for illiterate women and many farmers, uh, especially in Nepal, focusing on Nepal. And this book was created by agriculture professor, Professor Manish Raijada, and the graphic artist Lisa Smith from University of Guelph, Canada. And this is the outer cover of the book, picture book. And it's the scale like picture book of best practice for subsistence farmers. This is one is for the South Asian person. But if you want to have like for South Africa or the Latin American, you can find it in online in sacnepal.org. I have put that, uh, I have included that uh, links in the online in the, in the last slide. And uh, talking about my research, 
the main question was, does participatory editing and testing of the picture lesson increase the intention of small holder farmers in rural Nepal to use or apply these lessons uh, in order to improve their livelihoods? And the major objective we tested was to explain the methodological procedure on how to develop participatory based picture lessons and to pretest the effectiveness of these farmer edited lessons. And about the study size, we have conducted this study in two mid hill districts of Nepal and uh, the Hading district and Kaski district. In map, you can see like in, in between in the green, Kaski and Hading. And then this picture shows the hilly region or mid hills of Nepal where the corn are growing on the terraces. And while talking about this research, we have conducted this research in three phases. In the first phase, picture lesson was developed in 2015. And since second phases, the participatory editing, editing was done. And in third phases, field testing of those participatory editing pictures were done. And the key findings, like uh, the key findings from the phase one is that, like the lesson concept identified, uh, like they were based mainly based on the farmer survey and the local NGOs. And then, then after the Canadian graphic designer visited rural Nepal, and then design graphic design list like started, and then these those draft lessons were pre-tested in Nepal, and then revised and completed 100 pictures lessons. And during that testing, what it was realized is like this: this was the picture lessons developed in the first, but while in pre-testing, farmers asking like there is no text here so it's very difficult for them to understand so they requested like this is also the another example of picture lessons without text the farmer asked for to add some text so where the in the picture lesson were revised and then ed, text were added in nepali language you know, to make them understand the process and in the second phase after developing those uh, um, 100 lessons in the second phase, participatory picture lessons were edited in 2016. For this, it was tested with 56 female farmers in Mass Thana and Kaske districts. And during the process, the picture were projected in, in the computer and then the uh, projectors, and then 100 picture lessons were tested. And during the test phase, 500 edits were suggested by the women farmers. And um, there were like other 41 related lessons were added in the process. And what like about talking about the key reflection from this process was like the uh, women farmers found this picture lesson exciting and helpful for them to understand new practice and technologies. And while talking about young women, they found that um, because they, they were literate as compared to elder women, so they found um, more comfort, like they found comfortable reading this picture lesson and understand this lesson very easily. But uh, talking about elderly women, they face difficulty to get flow the, the flow of the picture in the lesson at first. And they were asking, also asking for the bigger size picture is poor eyesight is one of the major challenges for them. And uh, key reflection from uh, also other key reflections are like participants always try to recognize the type of plant and grain shown in the picture book. So what I learned, what we learned is like, whatever crop they grow in their local village, that should be reflected in the picture lesson so that they can own the, that pictures and then the, even the lessons, it increased their interest on the picture lessons. And the other, another is like they asked to show the cartoon character of picture lesson wearing the Nepali or the local dresses so they can relate themselves in that picture character. And too many pictures in own lessons and then in own page were very confusing for the woman farmers. So they asked for the few pictures in our flow going in the own, own pages. And we further discuss like why, what are the three major reasons for liking the pictures lesson among these women and men farmers. And they will say like the pictures were attractive, artistic and beautiful words were used. So which is also the consistency with the other previous study. And they said like another key factor for liking the picture lesson was subject matter provided in the booklet, which was previously also noted by other researcher. And then the layout of the booklet was the another reason they like it. And other study also shows that the font size and type trigger encoding the retrieval process that supports learning comprehension and remembering, which was also similar to our finding. And in the third phase, after editing those pictures, like in third phase, we did the field testing in 2017 and 2018. For that out of 141 at, uh, picture lesson, 20 highest priority lesson were selected by the farmers and extension worker. And these were uh, printed as a booklet and distributed to Nepali farmer, extension worker and scientist in two uh, mid-hill district of Nepal. 
and then let, uh, after five months of distribution, data were collected with the two groups of Nepali women and men farmers, like all together 180. We categorized this group as a control group and test group. Control group where they were never saw, see these picture lessons beforehand. And the test group were like, they also practice this um, technologies uh, while they receive this picture group. In this way, we conducted uh, collected data from 180 farmers. And we also collected the data from the stakeholders, uh, like 25 Nepali extension workers and scientists working with the smallholder farmers in Nepal. And the data shows like the uh, field test, from the field testing, the data shows that while we asked, did you understand the given picture lessons among farmers? They said like, yes. You know, if the picture said yes percentage, it shows like most of them understand the pictures. It's around like more than 80% uh, for all. And if you talk about the control farmers and the test farmers, it is also higher. And, the, and then the researcher team was surprised by farmers understanding because it's more than 80% for all cases. And we again further run the nominal association test to understand between the understanding of the lessons and the farmer sociodemographic parameters. It shows that gender, age, caste, and education did not significantly affect or associate with the understanding of the majority of the lessons. And then further we discuss like how useful did you find the picture booklets? And most of the farmers they, they said like uh, they understand, they found it useful. As, as compared to control farmers, the test farmer found it more useful. And then if we further ask, like, is this the right communication or approach or extension method for low literacy women farmers in rural Nepal? And then most of the farmers, like more than 85% farmers, they mentions like, uh, is, is the right approach, the right communication approach for the low literacy women farmers in rural Nepal? And we also further ask, like, who did the set picture book the most in your home? And then it's surpri surprisingly, it shows that young female and the adult female, which are shown in blue and then black, they were using this, uh, like reading the picture book at home. It also shows that children are less than 15 years old, they are also like shown in the light green here. They are also supporting their uh, mom to read and understand the lessons, which has the new, like interesting findings as compared to the other research. And we also discussed like, which media do you prefer for agriculture communications? And they said like, radio, local news, uh, local TVs, and then the picture lessons, picture books. They were the three major um, media they prefer for communications, for extension purpose. And how much would you pay for the sex picture booklet? Because we asked, like they said, they like it, they were gonna use it. And we just make to sure by asking the price thing. They, and most of they said, like, they are willing to pay less than $1, if you see in the dark blue area. They said, and some are saying like they don't free, free of cost because if it is available free of cost, then that will be good for them. And we, we further ask like, what would be the major three required facilitating condition to use or apply these picture lessons in the future? And they said like, there should be a relevant lessons included in the picture uh, book. And then it should be easy to understand. And they should have a regular interaction and follow up from somebody like extension agents or other organization working in the same area. And it should be low cost and it should be easily available. And we also discussed this um, sex picture lessons and it's been like benefit with the stakeholders and the stakeholders uh, perceive that it is helpful for the uh, smallholder women and men farmers in less developing countries like Nepal. And they mentioned that the required conditions should be like the communication, follow up should be there from some extension agents, and then there should be availability like distribution and low cost should be there. And then the farmers should have some kind of literacy to read and they have to have a habit of like reading at home and no advanced ICD should be available. And then visible literacy should also be there because it should match with the local culture and it should be easy to understand, which is most or less similar with the perception of the farmers. And we first further ask like, what are the challenges associated with the use of picture method in less developed countries? They said like the availability is the major challenges because even though the picture lessons are were produced by published by different organizations, but um, but they were not easily available at the local level, and it's difficult to adapt due to complicated pictures and then complicated messages, and and they're also difficult to adapt because there are lots of choices were available, so they are diff getting difficult to make a choice, and they also say like the farmer literacy uh, should be there, like they are not developed place, so. And they, they saw the less preference and so they need to develop the reading habit. 
And it also means that, like it's a passive tool and farmers want to interact with each other. In overall, what we learn from this research is like, uh, even though there is like uh, advanced ICT available, farmer prefers this uh, like old method of communications because high capital cost requirement combined with the limited digital literacy in village make advanced means of communication inaccessible to resourceful women and elderly farmer with low literacy. And the second learning that what I found is like, Pretty picture lesson still holds values in rural Nepal if developed using a participatory approach at all, st all stages of development, not only in like um, pretest like testing and editing, but from identifying the need and developing and then pretesting and then and bringing it to the market. And then another surprising in uh, lessons for us is like children can be one of the most promising target group for this kind of communication. So they can learn from early early childhood and they can uh, implement this behavior later in, in their life. life. And then the and last one is accessibility and availability of the picture lesson in remote areas are like some, uh, some limitations. So we should focus um, on those uh, aspects while we promote these kinds of extension lessons in communities. And then uh, the major recommendation while we develop this key uh, like uh, communi communicating materials among farmers are the pictures should be simple, easy to understand, low cost and with the stepwise procedure targeted to relevant topics or issues. And the, some sustainable distribution mechanism has to be created at the local level and proper mechanism for the interaction or follow up with the farmers about the different practice mentioned in the picture book should be established for the effective use of essential materials. These are the key recommended um, recommendations from our research. And if you want to find more details on this research, then the, the paper is available in sustainability journals. It's already been published in 2020. And uh, there is an acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge IDRC and all the team members from the SAC projects and farmers and stakeholders from Nepal. And if you want to have like a, individual picture lessons and the whole SAC book, then you can go to this link and download in free of cost. If you want to have a further information about this project or the picture book, you can either contact me or the professor Manish Raijada, who is the creator of this picture lesson. Thank you so much. And you are welcome for questions. Thank you. Roshana, thank you so much. What an excellent presentation and another good one today. And um, really interesting, um, really interesting work. I mean, there's so much actual, <laughs> really valuable gems of information in that presentation. I mean, I was interested by, by all of it, but I think you said there was like 500 edits by farmers uh, in, mm. in the discussion when they looked at the draft, um, yes. draft pictorial uh, education resources and I thought wow that's really interesting how many edits they came up with so I think that must have been a valuable process in itself really bringing yes. women together and then talking about actually what works for them and how they would edit it I think that it's incredibly valuable um, I even like the font size and the type was important I thought it was was really interesting people don't sort of think about um, and bigger pictures for for older women with poorer eyesight um, and also accessibility for children seems to be really an interesting um, and valuable um, aspect. Do you think, um, I mean, I find it really interesting that, you know, these are still valuable resources, hard copies, for example, um, of information. Do you think thinking about digital, um, the digital world, do, do you think that same concept of making sure these pictures are relevant to local farmers, do you think that more could be done in the digital world to make sure those pictures that are on the internet, that are on uh, training modules, that are on digital apps could also be um, similarly developed? Yes, uh, we, we, we think like it is possible, we can develop that way because anyhow they are going to use for their purpose. But while we talk about the rural areas, because they don't have internet access 24 yeah, hours. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we compare with like with how why they like the picture lesson compared to the uh, like a mobile and other videos. And the, the yep. main reason behind that is like the picture lesson is hard copy and it is available 24 hours at their home. So they can Definitely. read it whenever they need. So that's the main thing. Like they need a manual hard copy. But this process is same. We can have the, like either the digital or the we can yep. target the advanced summer farmers from the digital perspective. Yep. And tell me, do they, once they have these booklets, did you, do, do they keep the books? Did you do any study on whether they keep referring back to them? Mm, yes, yes. Yes. And, like, and they, they the do? Books, 
Sorry? They do refer back to them over time. Did you, did you look at whether they're still using them sort of next week and the week after? Yes, like we provided that book and then that was not the season for growing the crop. So we gave that book for five months and after five months, we visited the field and did the data collections. So like for 20% farmers, they found like difficulty finding the books because they like some, some were taken by the relatives because it has a beautiful pictures and all those diagrams. So they like it and they took for their own purpose. Some they misplace it, but 80% of the farmers has these picture lessons at home. Um, so when they are using right. this, whenever Excellent. they are confused, and they used to open it. And the main uh, main thing is like the female farmers, they were not uh, capable of reading it. And they are asking help for their husband or sometimes yep. the children or the young daughters. That's the like way they, they are learning yep. from the picture lessons. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And were there mm -hmm. any pictures that didn't work that, that that you tried that, you know, in that discussion with farmers when they when they did the edits? I'm interested to know what mm -hmm. what they thought didn't work. Like were there examples? Yeah, there where... was, yeah. There was a three picture lessons on breeding, on maize breeding techniques, like how to pollinate and do the maize breeding on their own for the farmers. It was yep. like the yep. process was very complicated. So farmer didn't want to look on that process. So say like they don't want to do it. Like they don't want uh, reading on the page of paper. They yep. want someone to teach them in the field. So on, so they want to learn it. So the main lesson from this one is like, they want the um, process simply described and for the easy way. Yeah? If it is okay. complicated, they, they are not ready to going to read and then practice in the field. So that's yep. the one of the yep. major learning for us. And the another is like, there are lots of illiterate women and men farmers in the rural village of Nepal. And around 25% 20 per, uh, respondent, they were not ready to toss the book. They said like, I never tossed book in my lifetime. So I didn't want to toss that one. I feel scared of it. So yep. like very difficult for me, a kind of barrier. So we also realized like there is a psychological barrier with them and they need some kind of person, extension person or agents or social motivator to motivate them to have a look and then learn from it. Yeah, excellent. And you only gave um, instructions on like positive things that they could be doing in the field. Did you, did you talk about instructions around what not to do? Yes, yes, we also discussed because uh, uh, they were saying like they were learning for the farm, from the farmers and they were saying like uh, as a social influencer they are learning from relatives or the close neighbors or the extension agents yeah? and they what they found is like who they were not a part in terms of test farmers what they found is like we're not a part of the projects they were making them discouraged to use those kind of technologies like those kind of picture lessons so yeah. you see, like, first decide by themselves like whether they want to use it or not another thing is like if you talk about the tech, like, uh, technologies or the making IPM kind of uh, like a biological pesticide or some kind of thing, then they were uh, like mixing those practice with the, their own practice and whatever. And, and then they have a bad results like their crop were dying or plants were dying and some kind of thing. So we said like, yeah. lessons were pre-tested before and in terms of scientific way. So you just should believe this, uh, like the amount and then the procedure and then follow in the field. No? Otherwise, okay. you may have a wrong result in the field. That's how we suggested. But they didn't okay. listen. That's the thing. <laughs> so just before we go, I mean, were there, were there any, um, just in your discussions with the, the group of farmer, women farmers, for example, were there leaders that stood out that seemed to uh, encourage others to, to um, adopt the behaviour? Or, or did you find that it was um, just generically everyone was uh, part of the group were there any that stood out as sort of no, early adopters no we also did uh, like uh, as a part of this research we also did in study on the social pressure peer pressure and what we found is like if the role model a kind of social motivator or the community leaders or the or the political leaders or the extension agent they were using it and promoting it then the farmers are getting influence and using it if uh, like um, in the person who has a lower background or the who has no no power or hierarchy in the society, then they are not uh, not listening to that person. So we found that there is also uh, the power and other hierarchy issues while we promoting these kind of things. 
Excellent. Oh, thank you so much, Roshana. Um, a brilliant presentation, really interesting work and very applicable um, for across Southeast Asia as well around how, how do we design um, communication resources um, and how do we communicate and design those with the farmer, uh, farmers involved and particularly to reach out to women. Uh, and, and we just had that reminder as well from Laura before at the end of hers around making sure that we are understanding who we're talking to and, and reaching out to the different members of the community. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Um, lots of great information packed in there. So I'm sure um, there will be um, interest for your presentation too uh, afterwards. And just to remind everyone, we will share all the presentations. Um, so mm -hmm. don't worry, you will have time to go back. So thank you very much, Roshana, for joining us. Good luck with your work. Yeah, thank you so much, Alison. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you all. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce our next speaker today, who's the wonderful Dr. Faye Roller Rubzin from the University of Western Australia. And um, she brings with her a huge amount of experience from being involved in many projects across um, Asia. Currently, Faye's working on the Farmer Behaviour Insights Project in India with smallholder farmers, and she's going to be explaining the power of behavioural economics to help explain farmer behaviour. Welcome, Faye. And you just need thanks. to, yep. Thanks, Alison. I'm just trying to get it's my coming. Um, do you have the? No, it's it's not quite going into the big format at the moment. Is it in the presenter view? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. <laughs> because I understand from Laura that we have, um, you know. Uh, audience from all over the world. So I hope you're all well. So as um, Alison said, my name is uh, Faye Rolla Rudzen. I am from the Center for Agricultural Economics and Development at the University of Western Australia here in Perth, uh, Australia. So my topic today, uh, which is on why do some farmers adopt uh, technologies, new technologies, while others don't. It's actually based on our project, uh, an, an ACR project, Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research Project. And uh, as the title would uh, suggest, uh, we are also looking at behaviour, similar to, you know, um, what other presenters are doing today. So let me just start my presentation by uh, quoting um, a very famous person who most of you would know, uh, probably, particularly our Bangladeshi colleagues. So um, he, he was the founder of Grameen Bank and a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Muhammad Yunus. And he actually said that poverty does not belong in civilized human society. Its proper place is in a museum. So that's uh, by Professor Muhammad Yunus. Um, so poverty has really been a scourge in many nations. And there's, that's why it has been a target of many governments uh, around the world, not just in Asia. Yet, uh, despite, um, despite all the efforts, massive investment in poverty reduction, there's still large pockets of poverty that exist around the world. And many of these very poor people live in South Asia, particularly in India, in Bangladesh, and Nepal. And of course, most of the poor as well, as we're all familiar with, are located in rural areas and are smallholder farmers. Because of this, uh, in a bid to combat poverty, many governments and aid agencies and development agencies have been looking at uh, farming innovation, such as improving conservation, uh, improved conservation agriculture, water management, and marketing systems in a bid to increase their productivity and resilience, particularly in view of climate change, which is really affecting agriculture uh, in Asia. Um, in our project, actually, we have been looking at what we call the conservation agricultural sustainable intensification technologies. And because it's a mouthful, we have called it CASI, or sometimes it's actually a form of conservation agriculture, but also looking at, you know, uh, looking at doing this in, in a sustainable manner. And this has been introduced in the Eastern Gangetic Plains in South Asia. Um, this has been going on for the last four years. However, what we have noticed is that despite the success of field experiments, the adoption of CASI outside the project sites is really quite low. And actually, uh, there are some studies that have been done and approximately around 3%, slightly over 3% of the culti cultivated area in the Eastern Gangetic Plains of India are in partial, you know, a zero tillage, which is one form of CASI. So why is this so? If it's actually promising, why are farmers not taking it up? 
So um, normally when we look at adoption, the conventional approach is that we assume that farmers of course are rational. And if they are rational, if it actually will benefit them, they will actually uh, also adopt it. But how is it that, you know, despite all these promising results, farmers, even at the peripheral of the sites of the project area, they are still not taking up the technology. Why? So one of the reasons that actually um, became, you know, sort of like uh, obvious to us, and there have been some, some discussions about this between researchers is that they have noticed that humans do not always act rationally. And I guess even us, you know, um, as consumers, for example, we do not always act based on money, on the economic benefits, because we are actually emotional. We are, human beings are emotional and we easily are distracted uh, by many things. Uh, so this raises the question on whether neoclassical economic theory alone can actually explain why farmers are adapting or not adapting a technology. So in our project, we applied behavioral economics, what I call BE, or behavioral science, to understand farmer decision-making in the adoption of conservation agriculture-based uh, sustainable intensification technologies. So just briefly, what is behavioral economics? So behavioral economics is a method of economic analysis that applies psychological insights into human behavior to explain decision making. And many of the previous uh, presenters also use that. Uh, Laura, for example, had a ver had very big uh, experiment on this, really excellent study on COVID and the take up of um, masks. So our study is actually a small, much, much smaller scale than Laura's study, uh, but we are looking at uh, farmers in the Eastern Gangetic Plains of um, South Asia. So um, how do we apply you know, behavioral economics to try and nudge farmers to improve their adoption? And when I say improve adoption, what I mean is to make adoption faster and more, greater. So if there is a component of the system, rather than just farmers adopting a small component, they look at you know, adopting different, you know, the entire package, if, or if not the entire package, as much of the package as can be. So, how do you change behavior? There are many potential influencers of behavioral change. And once again, my co-speakers have already alluded to some of them. Uh, for example, the messenger. So we are heavily influenced by who communicates the message. So if you get somebody who is a successful farmer, farmer would, farm, other farmers would listen more to them rather than if somebody they do not know or a, a farmer who has not been successful would actually promote the technology. Uh, also, we as individuals, uh, we respond usually to incentives, and it's the same with farmers. So if there is some incentive, logically we would think, or theory says that they would respond to that. The other things, for example, would be pre-commitments. So if somebody says, and I think Laura mentioned this, so if, um, if somebody says that I will do this, of course, especially if you declare that in public, it is so embarrassing if you don't do it because people will hold you accountable. So, you know, these are some of uh, the tools or strategies that can be used to, to promote uh, behavioral change. So in our project, we actually were testing many of these, but uh, the ones I'm going to present are only on two of these behavioral change. It's the incentives and commitments. But let me just talk briefly about what our project is all about. So the project, as I mentioned, is in South Asia. It's in three countries, India, Bangladesh, and Nepal, and it's funded by ACR. So it, we actually have a multidisciplinary team uh, comprised of uh, economists, psychologists, sociologists, agronomists, and we also have, of course, the agriculture, the conservation agriculture specialists. We have econometricians and statisticians. So the objective of our project, or objectives of our project, are first to determine whether behavioral economics can provide additional insights into adoption decisions of farm houses in the AGP. And the reason behind this is, of course, we want actually to make adoption more effective. And then to identify what are those specific behaviors and bottlenecks that would lead uh, to adoption or constrain adoption. And then based on this knowledge, we then design experiments, behavioral experiments, uh, embedding those behavioral insights to test which of them would be, in, would be effective and in what conditions would they be effective. So we use mixed methods approach. Uh, we use quantitative as well as qualitative. Um, and also we look at the literature prior to doing the study. And uh, what I'll be discussing briefly here is uh, just a, 
very briefly because it's quite a, a large, uh, we have also a report on this and currently writing some papers uh, and submitted some papers to journals. And so I'm just presenting a small component in the interest of time. But if anyone is interested, I'll be happy to share our reports and some of the published papers. So um, for qualitative study, we had focus group discussions and also key informant interviews. And for the quantitative, we have quantitative um, component, we have seven behavioral experiments that are ongoing at the moment. And to actually measure the effectiveness of some of those behavioral experiments, we then have an impact evaluation. So we have a baseline and an end line. And then we will actually also do some case studies to actually dig deeper into why this is so, the results are so. So just uh, coming to the results, in terms of the qualitative results, we have two research questions we wanted to answer. So note that this qualitative study is based on 30 focus group discussions, which involve 339 participants, uh, of which 45% are female. And also uh, on key informant interviews, we have 366 in-depth interviews. And part of these, most of these are farmers, around 42% are female. And we have around 23 that are uh, service providers, because um, we had to work with service providers in terms of the conservation agriculture uh, machinery. I'm not uh, sure how many of you know what a, conser uh, what a conservation agriculture is, but uh, this involves, for example, zero till or minimum tillage. So there are some machineries that are being used here. And in some cases, the farmers cannot purchase, purchase their own machinery, so they have to use service providers. This is the reason why we also included service providers. But what we have found out is that, um, yes, uh, definitely behavioral economics can provide additional insights. And we found that, of course, economics is important. They will not adopt it if it's not economically beneficial for them. But apart, apart from this, there are also non-economic factors such as psychological, social, cultural, religious, cognitive limitations, which are critical when farmers make the decisions. So for example, what their neighbors think would influence their adoption. So uh, I did not include some of the qualitative comments here, but one example is that sometimes, you know, some. One of the some of the women we interviewed said they are not they don't want to adopt or they they wanted to adopt Kasi but they are not adopting because their father-in-law said that it won't work and so they don't want to create you know a dissonance in the family so they are not adopting or some farmers say they wanted to try it but then they're embarrassed because the neighbors are saying that you know uh, they are not good farmers because with zero tillage, you just leave the stubble on the ground. And so they think that they are not good farmers. They don't clean their, their plots. So all of these you know, things have psychological effect on them, which prevents them from adapting the technology. The second research question that we looked at is what specific behaviors and bottlenecks are leading to our constraining the adoption? And here we found a lot of behavioral theories that influence adoption. For example, status quo bias. It's very difficult sometimes to change behavior of farmers because they tend to stick to what their conventional practice is because they're used to that. They would say generations of my family have been using this and it's giving us income, so we don't want to change. Uh, the other thing is also, uh, for example, dec decision inertia. So there's procrastination. I want to try it, but somehow something is stopping them. We, and this happens to all of us. Sometimes we procrastinate in making especially big decisions. And then um, there's also the loss aversion. They do not like the idea of losing. So if they're already happy with this, why would they change? Why change something that's working? Uh, and a big factor is the social cultural norms and beliefs. But on the positive side, altruistic behavior, for example, concern for the environment will make them adapt. So if we promote the technology as good for the environment, then you know they tend to adapt. But there's, as I mentioned, the social influence that as well, like the influence of neighbors, what neighbors would think that could actually uh, be a positive or negative. Because if the neighbor promote it and say, yes, it's good, most likely they are also going to try it. But if the neighbor is actually um, criticizing them, then that will be a hindrance for the adoption. So um, having found out from the qualitative studies some of the behavioral uh, insights, what we have done is to design some experiments to embed these. So uh, as I mentioned, we have seven experiments, but what I'm going to present is the West Bengal India case study, where what we have done is we, pre -test, we tested pre-commitment and micro-incentives. And um, 
the objective is we wanted to find out whether pre-commitment will increase adoption of CASI in India, in West Bengal, and also will it be sufficient? Is pre-commitment enough to nudge farmers to adopt or do we need to add micro incentives as well? So when I say pre-commitment, this is actually a, a method of self-control or strategy that someone can use, an agent, let's say an extension person or the researchers like us who are trying or testing this, um, where we restrict the, the choices um, of, of uh, the, the decision maker, or in this case, the farmer. But this is done through them making a commitment either privately, but usually publicly. It can be formal or informal, formal via written contract or just talking to a public, you know, just mentioning it in public that yes, I will try the technology, making a public oral commitment, pre-commitment. And the micro incentives are really just small rewards given out on a per behavior basis. And this can be monetary through, you know, uh, giving them price money, which uh, happened, um, I think, uh, in the experiment, one of the experiments that Laura presented, where they offered some cash incentives, or it could also be through discounts, which is what we did in our experiment. So we offered them discounts. So in this case, what we said is that if for the micro incentives, um, we will give them a 10% discount if they take up the CA, but they have to form a cluster. Uh, the reason for forming a cluster is that the service provider won't go if it's only one farmer because it will not be beneficial for the service provider. This is one of the complexity we have to deal with in the field. Even if farmers want to adopt, if there is no service provider, it won't happen. So we have to think, how do we get the service providers involved as well? So forming five, clusters. Five minutes, Faye. Okay, so forming clusters was one of them. So let me just um, jump to these things. Um, so we have three groups, the control, and then the pre-commitment, and then the pre-commitment plus micro incentive. And um, let me just jump. These are some of the tools uh, we had. So we had um, the contract, signed contract. We also have videos and the leaflets. So our control, actually, we, all we did was just have to, have to show them and talk about what conservation agriculture. But for the treatment one, we had them to sign the contract. And for treatment two, it's actually the contract plus the information, uh, sorry, plus the incentive. And this is what we found out. Uh, by doing that, when, when we actually tested the different groups, there is an increase in the number of farmers uh, who pre-committed. But the, the, there is a higher increase for treatment to which is the pre-commitment plus micro incentives. I'll just go through this very quickly. In terms of land adoption, in other words, this is the intensity. Then we, uh, once again, there's higher in the pre-commitment, which is this, this last bar graph here. Pre-commitment with micro incentive treatment two compared to the um, just the pre-commitment itself. We tested for difference in differences because one could argue that you know your treatment group might be higher adoption already in the first place. So to control for that, we do difference in difference method. And we found that, that there is no significant difference between the control and treatment one, but there is a significant difference between the control and treatment two. So, so this is actually, so as you can see here for this first group, it's not significant, but for the second group, it is actually significant. So, but the other thing as well is that the stated and revealed. So we asked them, are you going to have adoption? All of them increased in treatment one and treatment two. However, when you look at the revealed, the revealed is actually lower than the actual stated. So some, for some people or researchers who are just asking the stated, we have to be very careful because what they say may not necessarily be what they do. So I think it's also important uh, to look at what they do as well. So uh, once again, uh, this is demonstrated here uh, with the stated, it's 87.33% for treatment too, but for the, the um, uh, revealed, it's only 68.67, but still an increase. Okay, so let me just uh, then um, go straight to the, the findings. So what we have found is that between the two treatment groups, pre-commitment with micro-incentives significantly increase the CA land allocation or intensity of adoption. But when we compare the stated versus revealed, pre-commitment without micro-incentive had significantly lower revealed than the actual um, stated. And pre-commitment may increase the stated land area of farms allocated for CA, however, without micro-incentive 
it will not likely result to higher adoption. Um, thus, micro incentive is an important feature in pre commitment digest to increase adoption. Okay, so, um, so in conclusion, uh, pre commitment alone may not significantly increase CA adoption. Uh, but if you, if you combine that with micro incentive, then there is a significant uh, change in adoption. So, therefore, micro incentive can be an effective nudge um, in combination with a pre commitment for CA adoption in South Asia. So future work that still needs to be done, as I mentioned, this is a pilot study, it's very small. So we actually need to, um, you know, um, hopefully be able to roll this out. And that was the plan, but COVID hit. So we were sort of uh, stuck by COVID. But um, there are other ex experiments that we are doing uh, to overcome cognitive limitation. For example, you know, testing different methods of extension, framing video uh, messages positively or negatively, and also using her behavior and gender lens, and also using competition and text-specific reminders. And we also have a big experiment um, of uh, 1,500 testing for text messaging reminders uh, in terms of adoption. So finally, um, so we have experience here. Adoption is really a complex process, but behavioral economics seems promising in improving adoption. So it can potentially be a tool for increasing um, adoption, increasing income, and reducing poverty. But the thing that we noted is that nudging can be powerful, but there are ethical issues, as I'm sure uh, you know, some of you who are engaged in this research know. So we have actually have to practice the do not harm principle. In other words, if you want to promote something, a technology, we have to make sure that it's really going to be beneficial to farmers and not harm them. Because if not, imagine we nudge them, and if they do, then you know that would be terrible if we are actually decreasing their wealth. Finally, we need deeper understanding if we are applying, you know, um, behavioral economics to improve adoption and make poverty history, and hence, you know, um, meet Muhammad Yunus' vision, which I'm sure many of us here passionately share, of confining poverty to a museum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Faye. We've we've gone a little bit over time, so I'm going to ask you some quick fire questions. Okay, okay. very interesting and great to see um, the the research results so far, and also really interesting to see um, on the previous page just the the research that you will be looking at as well, which is a lot of interest to us around whether text messages work or videos or different ways to connect with different people. Um, extremely interesting. Um, what, here's a question here. Was there a difference according to the crop that they were growing on the whether they were to adopt the technology or not? So I saw you had maize yes. and I think you had some other crops as well. Did the yes. crop make a difference? Uh, yes, um, because, um, yeah, yes, uh, there was a difference because, uh, for example, we found the increase in adoption of uh, ZP maize uh, mm -hmm. and also boro rice. Uh, however, because it's a system, you know, they, re they reduce some. So there is a take up in some. And if you know that maize is actually a cash crop for some of them, for, the, yep. for some farmers. So there is an increase in that, which that's why when we measure the income, I didn't present the results of the income here, but the income actually increased because of the change in the system. So it's not yep. necessarily bad that they reduce some of their crops, but they increase others, if that's actually good for the overall farming system. Okay. How do you think you can encourage more adoption from those that say they will do something but don't end up doing it? So you talked about the revealed sort of um, statistics there. How do you think it's best to sort of get more of those to actually turn from saying they'll do something to actually doing something? Yes. So I think a lot of them, so we have tried to find out in terms of the qualitative as well, the rationale, why they are still not adapting. So again, as I mentioned, there are many um, behavioral factors and it's targeting those specific behaviors. For example, uh, you know, um, we found that for women, the social norms as well. So, so mm -hmm. in, in another project that they're working with, we actually tried to target that by trying to talk about, for example, some of them say, oh, women cannot handle a machine. But we actually show them by, by involving women in our uh, experiments uh, or in our demonstrations, that the women can handle the machine as well if you give them training and women were willing and it's so amazing to see that at the start men and women both were reluctant but towards the end the men were actually supportive of their wives to actually do 
you know, and take this out. Because in fact, some of them said, well, it's going to reduce my workload. So why not, you know? Uh, but then, you know, so there are things. And one of the experiments we're doing actually is looking at framing. So if we frame the message positively, will this actually change, you know, behavior? Because yeah. farmers, you know, some, some of them, right, or individuals, we like to do things when it's framed in a positive manner compared to a negative manner. Yep. So we, yep. but we also, because people are different, one of the things we're doing is so we're trying to analyze what types of farmers tend to do this and what types of farmers do tend to do another or prefer another and then sort of like yeah, say that, that's interesting because you had a range of factors um and i was quite interested oh no you had your range of influences of behavior for example incentives commitments that you chose why did you choose incentives and commitments rather than defaults for example go with the flow which seems to be potentially quite a common one too what what made you settle on the two that you chose yeah the defaults because the defaults was in, in their case was the conventional tillage yeah so we actually went for we wanted them to change actually so we had yep. to introduce this but the reason and the reason why we have six experiments and particularly for for this in west bengal we have those two pre-commitment and micro incentives is because in the qualitative study that seemed to be the one that will work so we, we had to do like sort of like, you know, fit for purpose sort of thing, which one seemed to be the one that uh, can be tested there is what we have chosen. Okay. If we had more funding, we would have done it in all countries. But so yep. in this case, because of the limited funding, we had to be selected. Okay, great. Well, I'm really interested to see um, the results of your, your next stage of research. Um, that, that's going to be fascinating. Um, actually, could you, if you could stop sharing your screen, I'll just get Rika to load hers up. Thank you so much, um, Faye. Um, you, you really, really interesting, really quite um, difficult questions you're trying to ask there and, and solve. And um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to inviting you back next year to, so, or maybe the year after to see the results from your next phase and kind of what communication um, and framing processes work as well uh, in, in the work going forward. So thank you very much, Faye. Thanks, Alison. Thank you. And I'm now going to introduce Rika. Um, and Rika is uh, joining us. She's from IRI and she's going to talk about a very uh, important uh, example. Uh, and this is um, really interesting because it's going to be around how we can catalyze the widespread adoption of farmer best management practices, what we've just been talking about, but actually use a successful case study of the adoption of best mass management practices amongst farmers in the Mekong Delta. Um, so Rika, um, welcome. And Faye, you can you can turn your video off now if you would like, or you can keep it on. We, we love seeing, seeing you. you, so. Good day, everybody, and good evening to those in the other side of the world. Thank you for joining our webinar. As uh, Alison mentioned, I'm talking about um, how the use of, of a policy mechanism as a way to catalyze adoption and i just want to confirm alison no you're not on your big no you're on. not on the big screen so if you could just enlarge it let me just try Uh, let me try it again. Uh, did if that not, work? I, no, it didn't. Hmm. I can load mine up if you would like. Uh, that might be. That okay, might be let better. me try that. Okay, everyone, just just hang on there. I'm just going let to. Me, um, I'm going to stop that. Let me stop. Let me stop the presentation. That's okay. okay. I've okay. got you. Thanks. I've Thanks. got con I've got control, Rika. So <laughs> the ultimate. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's handy. That's handy. It's so very well, handy. As, as as the talk is loading, uh, I just want to preface this with with the idea that uh, a lot of the projects really use um, as an outcome um, targeting policy, because policy is a useful tool um, to generate widespread. Um, widespread knowledge and also bringing it to attention of, of different stakeholders and not only farmers. So uh, that's why um, this case was interesting for us because it was a case where there was in Vietnam a national uptake of uh, a package of best management practices. 
Uh, next slide, please. And in this package, there's, of course, the government, but there are also other players, particularly in the private sector. And I'm going to talk more closely about the mechanisms that created uh, a sort of synergy around the way that uh, this package of one must do five reductions got uh, spread out to the farmers. Next slide, please. Let me uh, uh, give this caveat uh, at the beginning. Uh, so then we think of once it gets to the policy, it will surely spread, but it's not always the case. Uh, they say the devil is in the details. The mechanisms of each policy are different and the way that different stakeholders um, adjust to those mechanisms and take on board those mechanisms and create their own also supports the scaling of the technology. And that's what I will discuss in a couple more minutes. Uh, next slide, please. So a brief introduction on one must do five reductions. It is best management practices for rice. So across the different production uh, activities in rice, and it has one must do, which is use good seeds and then reduce a lot of things. Reduce seed rate, reduce your fertilizer, early your nitrogen application, because in the Mekong Delta uh, in Vietnam, it wasn't as much needed. Uh, reduce your insecticide, if possible, no application of insecticides or no application within the first 40 days. Reduce your fungicides, reduce your water use, and reduce your post-harvest losses. So all this were taken up in uh, one package that the government uh, decided on. Uh, next slide, please. I think you may have heard from earlier sessions about uh, three reductions, three gains, which is a campaign to also um, pro pro promote sustainable practices in Vietnam. And it was quite successful some years ago. And this uh, campaign and this uh, packaging of best management practices, the 1M5R, was built on that. But it was also built on adaptive research. And I will not talk so much about that. Uh, the other speakers really talked about engaging with the far farmers, finding ways in which men and women and other uh, types of farmers, uh, whether they're poor or rich farmers, landed, etc., how they, how they benefit from it and having the cycles of learning. So I will not talk so much about that. Um, next slide, please. The one must do five reductions, uh, magically, uh, in, in just in my presentation, um, was quite well adopted. Um, it's uh, by 2020, more than 100,000 of farmers were adopting it. And this is not just said they adopted, they really monitored for it. And these are the figures. And when we did an independent survey looking at those practices, there, there was quite a high uptake of the different components of the 1M5. So that was good. what brought that along. Uh, next slide, please. There was a- uh, Just Rika, just, just could you just turn yes? your, um, just turn your camera off. I just, the connection's a little bit, a little bit difficult okay. every so often. Okay, great. Okay, sure. So, um, there was a, indeed a strong communication strategy, and this was really learning together with the different uh, partners in Vietnam, also with the different farmers and end users, but also a high profile rollout. And that's also not my focus of the presentation. So I will move uh, on the next slide. I will look at what were the policies that worked to bring out um, 1M5R. When they had the um, high profile rollout. It was also the day when the government um, announced that the one must do five reduction is the national sustainable management practices of uh, practice that's being adopted in, in the country. And having that announcement also enabled a government infrastructure all the way from the top ministry um, to uh, say a regional level uh, crop protection uh, department all the way to uh, sub uh, level, which was reaching out to the communes in the district. And in this uh, government infrastructure, there were people who could provide extension and training. There were people who could do monitoring. And yes, this may not be such a such an extensive infrastructure compared to the number of farmers that are in, in the Mekong River Delta, but that was very useful as a base for what the other policies needed and what the other um, stakeholders needed. 
there was also at the same time another government initiative, which was the Small Farmers Large Fields. This was also another policy, but the aim was basically to allow the farmers to group together, to coordinate their production, and then to market better. So the Small Farmers Large Fields had the intention to support marketing rather than production. But because they wanted to market in a high quality or in a, in a market that was looking at sustainable, uh, sustainably produced rice, the farmers also got training on 1M5R and they used 1M5R as a base for those groups that were producing for the small farmers large fields. Another uh, government uh, policy that also came up about during that time was the good agricultural practice, the Viet Gap certification. This is a mechanism that also came about because Vietnam realized that they can sell uh, sustainably produced rice at a higher quality uh, market rather than just the normal uh, international market. So they were encouraging certification. Later on, sustainable rice platform certification was also adopted. But basically, these certification mechanisms had a, a different set of, of checklists. But they used the 1M5R as a base to train the farmers. This is at the bottom of everything that you need to do, change this one. And then it will be easier for you to pass the certification, whether it's VietGov or SRP certification. So this also came with mechanisms to monitor the farmers, to check their production, and then to link them to the market who will provide a price premium for, for their um, produce. Another uh, big government program was the Sustainable Agricultural Transformation Project. And this project was looking more at not only the farmers and the farmer groups producing sustainably, but also what about the industries? What about the service sector? And it involved banks, it involved um, machinery uh, providers, it involved millers. And all of these sectors could get uh, some grants from the government to be able to uh, reach their own targets towards sustainable um, agricultural transformation. And where this is crucial was the BNSAT project used the 1M5R as a training tool for the farmers to have sustainable transformation. But Faye mentioned the importance of incentives. Indeed, this project also provided incentives in that the, a group of farmers, say 500 in one cooperative, they would be trained on 1M5R. But if they reach a set adoption target of those uh, lists in the 1M5R, they would then be able to access a grant from the government of at uh, most 400,000 US dollars per cooperative. And so this, all of these together, uh, policies create many different mechanisms for extension, for monitoring, coordinating the groups, finding the incentives. It wasn't just the government and the extension people that were working. There were also um, the cooperative leaders, the farmer groups that were training their own farmers and, and enabling them to um, to adopt the practices so that the group as a whole can achieve um, that set target and that they can then um, get the, the grants. Um, another area on the next slide, please, is the private sector. As all those policies were being implemented, the private sector was also engaged. The traders, the exporters, they are looking at what they can also sell in the international market and they are seeing that this uh, 1M5R can help them to be able to get the bulk of uh, sustainably produced rice. And so they were also investing on training, on monitoring, on certification. Um, there were also input companies such as the fertilizers that realized they could be on board in this policy. And they were giving already set um, measured uh, um, inputs that the farmers can easily use uh, for example, uh, the type of fertilizers that were recommended uh, split into however many splits that, that the extension would recommend. And then the extension staff would then support for the engagement of this input company so that the, the pattern that they will follow is 1M5R. So next slide, please. 
what this is basically doing is there are different um, networks of people. And in these networks, they have different targets, whether it's improving the use of inputs, it's consolidating production, it's having contract farming, it's getting your produce uh, certified. But there were many uh, um, overlaps in this, uh, the, the focus of the different stakeholders. And underlying all that, they used the 1M5R as a tool to ensure that the farmers have or are learning the, the ways in which they can achieve those, uh, the, the focus, or whether it's they can achieve the certification or they can get the contract and they can sell together. So there was uh, an alignment of these different uh, social technical systems and the different um, incentives that, that were provided by the stakeholders were uh, able to ride on to the spread of one must do five reductions. So last thing, in conclusion, it is that alignment that helped to spread one must do five reduction. And what I wanted to say here is that it's not just because there was policy uptake, there was simply a, a push of the technology down the line and then farmers adopted it. Actually, there are many aligned initiatives, both the public and the private sector created their own uh, incentive mechanisms and they also have their own, um, uh, their own focus, their own targets uh, that were aligned to one must do five reductions. Uh, because of that, there should also be a caveat in terms of uh, policy mechanisms that there will be diverging interests. Uh, maybe some uh, input companies are not just interested in reducing inputs. Maybe they're also interested in, in selling the inputs, selling more, selling more expensive inputs. So there will be those uh, diverging interests that the farmers or, or the groups have to manage. But uh, I want to reiterate what, what Faye was presenting uh, earlier on incentive mechanisms. And what I want to say here is that it's not only the incentive mechanisms for the farmers, it's also incentive mechanisms that goes at the group level. It's also incentive from the traders, also perhaps incentives from the service providers. So there are many different stakeholders that have these incentives and that becomes crucial to enable that, that mechanism that will either check the farmers, that will uh, um, promote the knowledge, promote the practice to the farmers. And that said, uh, thank you for this opportunity to share. If you would like more, uh, this is published in this link. Thank you Allison? so much. Thank you so much, Rika. Excellent presentation as always, and, and lots to think about there. And it's it's really interesting having, um, you know, a real a project that has been successful um, and that has really involved all those stakeholder groups. Um, a couple of questions. We're, we're running out of time, but I really want to ask you a few questions. This the small farmers, large fields concept. I mean, I think that's quite interesting. Do you think this can be, or is it being applied to the adoption of other technology, for example, drone? Owns for smallholder farmers. Do you think that idea of, I guess, bringing smallholder farmers together, but looking at how to drive technology adoption across a larger scale, is that uh, being looked at? Do you know? Well, that was mentioned by Lockroy. One of the in, in doing this study, I interviewed uh, different stakeholders, and, and one of the stakeholders I interviewed was Lockroy, which is an importer company, uh, uh, an international company that also does contracts. And aside mm -hmm. from the 1M5R, they're also providing uh, machinery services. And to reduce the seed rate, they also uh, lend their own seeders. And that's how they can tell the farmers that don't worry, just reduce the seed rate so you can reach um, the target. But you also use this machine. It enables you to uh, seed uh, in rows. And so, so the, the service was also there alongside um, the practice of one must do five reduction. Okay, so it was sort of integrated within the the sort of program, was it? With with the lock try, um, with their yep. uh, sort of program, because lock try okay. also has like ninety thousand farmers that they reach in one season. Okay. So it's quite a big program from the private sector. Yeah, and is it something? Somebody's asking here. Is it something like a group farming concept? I mean, are, 
how would you explain it? Is it farmers coming together and it, do they, how, how do they agree on doing? Um, actually, work? that's where the top down part came because the top down part was really uh, sort of encouraging from the leaders, from the extension, and from the sub uh, PPD, which is Plant Protection Division, uh, plant mm, something, crop production and plant protection. And they yep. would then uh, select the the, the um, nearby plots and will be consolidated. And they would encourage the farmer to form group so that the group coordinates the production. So you don't just plant on your by yourself whenever you want. You basically yep. get that support to, to know when to start. And then you start as a group. Uh, you get services as a group. You might get inputs from, uh, say, um, uh, contract farmer uh, yeah. or, or, or a contract trader and they will provide the inputs already measured um, according to your area and that's what you can use over the season. Okay a question here how, how do you best compromise or manage those diverging interests for example a company that just wants to sell a lot more of their produce how, how did you how did that sort of how did they cope with that management of those interests I guess in the in the one must do five reductions I mean obviously some of those reductions are reducing some things that companies are selling yes how is that best yes. managed uh, that is that is really where the sub PPD the government office and the extension uh, played a good a very big role if you uh, look at this diagram um, at, uh, the diagram where there was overlaps at the center yeah. of that is the sub PPD they are okay. really the ones who are managing the interactions between the private companies and also the farmer cooperatives. And the private companies, they can sell. And yes, there are some incentives um, around um, buying their product, but they're also uh, is a, a sort of a neutral uh, body that's provided by the government. So okay. that's important. Okay, that's interesting. And one last question before we go, and we will finish on time today, everyone, because I'm going to be very quick in the summary, but very quickly, um, Rika, what's the importance of lead farmers or some farmers within those communities at uh, being the first to adopt technology? Actually, we're very key in terms of coordinating the group, but also uh, spreading the knowledge and then uh, monitoring their other farmers. Because uh, I can imagine that not all the 500 farmers in one cooperative will be monitored by the extension uh, person. Yeah. There's probably a limited uh, reach for that. But it is those other farmers that are clearly uh, looking at the group should be able to uh, get that grant or to be able to reach uh, that set adoption target. So okay. those farmers help to monitor the others. And I think that's also not just knowledge, but also monitoring and, and helping the other farmers. Excellent. Thank you. That's a good place to leave it. And thank you so much, Rika, for joining us again. Really interesting case study uh, and lots to think about there around the organisation of farmers and the role of government and all the other stakeholders, which I think um, bringing all those stakeholders together and looking to align um, socio-technical systems and, and their interest underscores the needs for a food systems approach. So that was my takeaway at the end of this summary that I quickly made for everyone. But I think also reflecting back on all the speakers today, it's really important to listen to farmers and understand their reality. And, and Brian gave a very good start starting presentation around that and all the other speakers um, have mentioned that. Um, social relations are really important and understanding the range of incentives and nudges and all those other influences of behavior uh, is critical for effective implementation, but really highly contextual as well. So it's worth remembering that these incentives and other nudges and behavioral influences are really different for different people and communities. So do your homework in the field, I think is one of the key takeaways. Adoption is a really complex process. It's also sometimes non-linear. So um, we had a lot of speakers talking about that complexity uh, and what we often say that we will do doesn't always translate into action into the field. So what are the ways that we can help and support farmers actually adopt new behavior? Really interesting, important topic. Um, I think Rishana gave an excellent presentation which underlined the need to really develop resources that work for those that are using them 
So find out what works for them in their day-to-day -day living and working environment and consider a range of communication styles. So that's my very brief summary. It doesn't do justice to the wonderful presentations, but I'd like to thank all the speakers today. I'd like to thank all the participants today. It's our last session. It's part of this communication workshop series. They can all be found, all the presentations and videos on our pharma communication page. It's been wonderful to highlight some of these really um, interesting and critical pieces of work with you all. And I've really enjoyed the series and um, all the presenters that have participated in across the whole six months. So that brings me to an end. I'd like to thank um, Putra as well for helping out in the session and other sessions. Thank you to the speakers today. Thank you all and please keep safe uh, and healthy and um, I look forward to seeing you uh, in the future. Thank you very much.